All right. Um, I'm now going to invite Stephanie and John uh, to speak to us. Uh, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Sharon. Um, as Sharon said, my name is Stephanie. Um, I am a postdoctoral fellow at Vanderbilt University. Let me just share our slides here. Um, and Dr. Schenefer is also on the call. So you guys should be able to see slides now. Is that correct? That is right. Excellent. Wonderful. And so we are both here, though, to answer questions. So please, um, after, after we get done discussing, please ask, ask us anything that's coming to your mind. We're very much here and open to discuss. So our talk today is entitled Removing Soft Tissue Calcification. We've been talking a lot today about different therapeutic options for preventing soft tissue calcification. But we're gonna to talk today also about some of the work our lab has been investigating about how could we start to pharmacologically go after those lesions that are already there or those little areas of calcification, um, such as those that are seen in patients with PXE. So I first want to introduce you to our laboratory group. This is our lab group at Vanderbilt within the Department of Orthopedics. We're comprised of both basics and translational scientists, as well as numerous medical students and residents that work with us. Within the laboratory, we're investigating both how your bones and muscle, as well as your blood, communicate to each other following an injury, and how this communication is important for both how your body responds to that injury, but also how it initiates repair in order to heal your tissues properly. And so to talk today, we first want to define soft tissue calcification, how we look at it in the lab. Soft tissue calcification is defined as the barren formation of mineralized tissue within a soft tissue environment. So you want to think of hard tissue forming where normally it would be soft, such as in your muscle, in your skin, and in your tendons. This happens because soft tissues, if they're injured, and this can either be the formation of a traumatic injury, such as a burn, a blast, or a spinal cord trauma like we would see in orthopedics, but also the little micro injuries of life that you accrue over time that are very important for soft tissue calcification diseases, such as PXE. When injury happens though, this means that soft tissues can form calcification. And this is because your body is super saturated with calcium and phosphate so that at the site of injury, little calcium and phosphate crystals can form on top of that injured tissue. Now, many people have had injuries and calcification does not form. And this is because your body has protection mechanisms that help prevent this calcification from occurring. And these include things like pyrophosphate that we've talked a lot about um, today as well as other mechanisms like plasmin and osteopontin that our lab is also very interested in. Now it's important to note though, that if any of these mechanisms are lost or removed, and this can be due to genetic mutations such as ABCC6 associated with PXE, or dysfunction caused by severe trauma such as burns and blasts, this can lead to the formation of dystrophic calcification, putting your soft tissues at risk for calcification following these injuries. Now it's important to note though, that our lab is starting to learn that in soft tissue such as skeletal muscle, dystrophic calcification that forms actually has multiple fates. And this can be that the dystrophic calcification can be removed by a cell known as a macrophage that's also known as a big eater cell. So macrophages can come in and eat up the dystrophic calcification and remove it from the tissue, allowing the tissue to heal properly. But we're also learning that if macrophage function is inhibited in any way, this can lead to that dystrophic calcification staying in the soft tissue and going on to form actual full-fledged bone that you can see here. This is really important in the orthopedics community because it can lead to a disease called as heterotopic ossification or HO. And this can happen a lot of times in veterans following big burn and blast injuries where the skeletal muscle can mineralize, causing bone to form across joints. And this can cause massive joint dysfunction, pain, and immobility. As you can see here in the picture, this is a hip that the bone is actually fusing across that hip joint, making it unusable. Now for the context of PXE though, we really wanna talk about what we're learning about dystrophic calcification and its regu normal regulation mechanisms in your body, such that by understanding these mechanisms that are normally happening in your muscle, can we utilize them therapeutically to help with conditions such as PXE? 
And so the ideal therapeutic that we want to design for PXE would be one that not only blocks dystrophic calcification from forming or that initial soft tissue calcification. And these are going to include things like um, oral pyrophosphate that you're hearing about or bisphosphonates or TNAP inhibitors, a lot of the drugs we're talking about. But we also want to think about therapeutics that we can enhance this macrophage mediated removal of dystrophic calcification as a possible alternative to getting rid of those mineral deposits. Now that brings us to our main research question we're going to talk about today. And that is, can we enhance that macrophage clearance of dystrophic calcification within damaged tissues? And secondarily, while we're not going to talk about this at great effort today, and another important consideration is what effect do some of these other therapeutic options, like we're talking about, such as oral pyrophosphates or bisphosphonates, do they have any negative effect on that dystrophic calcification clearance? So to answer this first question, one drug that our lab has been investigating is monophospholipyl A, or MPLA, as we'll talk about it today. MPLA is a really interesting therapeutic because it gives us the ability to enhance macrophage function so that they can eat things like pathogens and clear them out better. And MPLA therefore is commonly utilized as a vaccine adjuvant to make your body clear out pathogens better. And so from this numerous amount of prior work that's been done in the infection field, our lab wanted to then ask the question, could we utilize the same therapeutic to enhance the macrophage clearance of soft tissue calcification instead of the clearance of a pathogen. And so what we've done is we've used the same PXE mouse model that you've heard a lot about today, and we induce a muscle injury to the lower calf of that mouse. This mouse then got MPLA or controlled treatment two days before injury or one day before injury. The muscle injury was applied and we evaluated them at seven days post-injury for the amount of soft tissue calcification that formed. What's really great about utilizing the muscle is that we can actually look using x-ray for the amount of soft tissue calcification present, as you can see here. So just like you would do in a patient where you can x-ray, we can x-ray a mouse and then look at the amount of area of soft tissue calcification forming in that damaged muscle, as you can see here outlined in yellow. This allows us to then evaluate how much calcification there is. In our control treated animals, what you see is that they had robust calcification by seven days post injury. However, in the mice that were given that MPL, MPLA treatment, what we see is that they had much less calcification present by that seven day time point. But very interestingly, and this is very important, is that we can confirm the effects of MPLA by actually knocking out the macrophages. If we take out the macrophage, the MPL therapy no longer has an effect, demonstrating to us that indeed it is acting through a macrophage mediated mechanism to help clear out that calcification. And so this data is showing us that indeed MPLA treatment can boost up that macrophage to reduce the amount of soft tissue calcification. But there's a, there's a lot of information we have to consider going forward. This treatment might be very helpful and utilizing this type of idea of how do we clear out that calcification, not only for trauma-induced calcification and PXE lesions, but we have to learn a lot more about what role do macrophages play at both of these lesion sites. Can the macrophages get there appropriately? We know that we see them in our injured tissue, but a lot more information is needed about the PXE lesions that we need to look at to see if the macrophages could even get to these sites. Additionally, we need to look at what is the therapeutic window of which a treatment like MPLA may actually be efficacious. The drug treatment um, strategy that we've used here suggests that that um, treatment strategy would last for about 15 days, but we really need to think about what effects this would have if we were giving it as a lifelong therapy, such as in a condition like PXC, or also following a trauma, when would it be most efficacious to give it? We also have to think about all trends we're using is that since tissue injury is at the base of soft tissue calcification, what effects would these drugs have on tissue repair? And also what would new therapeutics also do to the macrophage in this um, essential clearance mechanisms? This kind of comes to our secondary research question of if macrophages are so important, we also have to pay close attention to what the other drugs like bisphosphonates or oral pyrophosphates also due to this pathway potentially. 
And with that, I'm just going to kind of conclude the work we've been talking about today is really looking at this idea of an ideal therapeutic of something that not only has the ability to inhibit mineralization, but also still enhance that clearance of dystrophic calcification. Now, this may not be one drug. This may need to be a combination of drugs to enhance both of these mechanisms. And that's where a lot of the work our lab is looking at of when can we give it, what should we be giving in order to be truly an ideal therapeutic event against combating dystrophic calcification. Um, and again, you know, what we love about the PXC community and the work we've been doing is that so much of what we learn in orthopedics translates so well to the PXC community. And so while um, Dr. Schenecker is an orthopedic surgeon and my research is primarily in orthopedics, we're so excited to share with what we're learning because there's so much direct translation between the two um, where we hope we can also make an impact in the PXC community going forward. And with that, I love to just give out some shout outs and thank yous to both PXC International, um, Lily and Yoni. They've been great support for our work getting started in the PXC community, but really, you know, the most important people I need to thank is Sharon and the James O'Loughlin PXC Research Fund. Um, without funding, this work would not be possible. And without PXC International, that would not be possible. So thank you so much for uh, listening today. And I'd be happy to take any and all questions. Great, thanks so much, Stephanie. Uh, I know that John's on with you as well. So uh, any questions, folks? While we're teeing up questions, I'll tell you that my intersecting with John came in one of those magic moments that one only has a few of in life. And that was that when we learned that it was pyrophosphate that was responsible here for the peripheral tissue mineralization, I sat at my desk and Googled and then looked up papers and found John's name. And of course, PXC has never been involved in the orthopedic area at all, ever thinking this would be part of what we would do. And I emailed John and in five minutes, he emailed me back because he <laughs> said, how did you know that he was also thinking about this? So it was a very serendipitous moment. Very lucky for us. And we uh, sure hope that we can end up helping out in the world from and improve the health of everybody. So we really, really appreciate that. Great. So a question, uh, does more vigorous exercise help to break up this calcium buildup? So that is an amazing question. And I can tell you that we just purchased about uh, 30 wheels for the mice to run on. And hopefully we can answer that question for you in about a year or two. What's wonderful about mice is, is that they run about a five uh, kilometer race every single night. They just voluntarily get on the wheel and they run 5K. And we've already picked up lots of really interesting things off of monitoring both their desire to run and also what it does to these wheels. So I can't answer that definitively. We have a good hypothesis that well-timed and the right amount of exercise is actually going to be very good for giving signals to break these lesions. Great, thanks. And then another question. I was wondering if someone can comment about risk from a concussion. I fell and hit my head very hard. What impact should I consider or watch out for? Can there be calcification around the injury? So that's a great question also. And right now our injury models have been limited to the muscle. Um, the neurologic component definitely in regards to calcification with injury exists. We have not looked into it yet. Um, but uh, concussion is definitely something to be concerned about. The bigger part of that to understand, though, is, is that one thing Stephanie mentioned at the tail end of this, and this is the one problem that we're concerned about, about extrapolating this to PXC, is we do believe that many of the areas where people build up calcification, if you just read through uh, the literature, are areas where little macrophages have a hard time getting in. And one area like that is nerve tissue around the brain. And so our concern about this going forward is going to figure in this out is how to make it so that they would work in areas that don't normally work. Great. And then last question is the general direction of this last research uh, it, that there's a chance of inhibiting the skin uh, or other symptoms pre-onset and even potentially reversing calcification. That's great, and that's the grant that I am looking at. Uh, Yanni, who's staring back at me, but we put that grant in to go after that, and we're going to do that once again, right, Yanni? <laughs> we need to put that grant back in because that's the big question: is we believe that the skin is an immune privileged area, and these macrophages have a hard time getting.
there. We need to figure that out because if they, if that's one of the reasons why people build this up in the skin, we might, or we're going to have to take a different approach to doing it. But if the macrophages can readily take care of those lesions, um, then we do think that drugs like Stephanie that works out very well with MCLA uh, could either topically or orally help out in those areas. And actually one final question that I'll make a comment on and then pass to you, John and Stephanie, and that is, should one undertake plastic surgery to correct manifestations of PXE? What would be the concerns re soft tissue repair? Um, we did have a plastic surgeon, our first time ever, thanks to Yoni. Eric uh, came on yesterday morning and said, in fact, healing is very good and that there isn't any issue. Um, but from your point of view, anything else you'd like to add to that? Yeah, so um, very similar response to the other one, which is that we, it, as long as the lesions are in areas that macrophages can get to, which most skin healing processes do, then we think even if you had a temporary increase of calcification because of PXC, for example, the macrophages could take care of it. And that's what Stephanie has shown so well in her model, is although all these mice get calcification in the muscle, it all goes away. And that's the part of this that we really want to highlight, that this is a very dynamic process. And as long as the macrophage can get there, at least in our animal models, it's able to clear it out. And again, that's why we think that calcifications may build up in areas of the body that the macrophage isn't designed to work well in. Great, John. That's very helpful because for years, of course, we've all wondered why, number one, it's certain flexor areas, not all flexor areas, you know, under the arms, behind the knees, in the groin. Um, the plastic surgeon yesterday said the face, for example, heals much better and is more forgiving than under the arms. And, and so this is, sounds like it's uh, uh, dovetailing with what you're saying as well. Great. Great. All right, well, thank you guys very much. Thanks. And thanks.